I'm Johanna Derlega, publisher of The Hill, and welcome to The Cost of Caring, Family Caregivers, and Tax Reform. I'd like to thank our sponsor, AARP, for making this event possible. Our conversation today will put the spotlight on the many Americans who, while working, are providing unpaid care to family members and relatives uh, to help them live independently at home and um, out of more costly institutional care. The timing of this discussion could not be more opportune. Uh, while tax reform negotiations have gained traction in the nation's capital, bipartisan efforts are also underway in Congress to provide a tax credit to working family caregivers. The administration's tax overhaul plan includes tax relief for child care and dependent expenses. Uh, we are here this morning to discuss the approach Congress is likely to take and examine the cost-benefit ramifications of a new tax credit. Just a few things to keep in mind before we get underway. Um, we just ask that you silence your cell phones, but please do join the conversation on social media. You can follow us on Twitter at The Hill Events, and you can also comment using the hashtag cost of caring. Without that, I'd like to now um, invite Nancy Lamond, who is the Executive Vice President and Chief Advocacy and Engagement Officer of AARP, to provide brief remarks. Well, we want to thank the Hill and want to thank all of you for being here today. Uh, I know that you are uh, very happy this is a very air-conditioned room. Uh, we, we have ahead of us an interesting discussion with a bipartisan group of congressional leaders, Senator Ernst, Senator Baldwin, Congressman Donovan, and Congressman Lujan Grisham. And we want to thank all of them for taking time out of what we know is a very busy schedule to come to this uh, bipartisan and bicameral oasis. Uh, if there's one issue we believe has the power to unite us across parties and ideologies, across age, income, and gender, it's the issue of family caregiving. At kitchen tables across America, real families are confronting the same questions. How will we care for mom and dad or another loved one if something happens and they can't care for themselves? And 40 million Americans like you and me, and actually by a show of hands, how many of you are or have been family caregivers? Well, that's a kind of statement that uh, we can underscore today. Uh, are already, 40 million of us are already caring for loved ones. Uh, many of us can picture, and our data reveals, a so-called typical family caregiver, a woman 49 years old, working full-time and spending 24 hours each week caring for her mother. But in this case, that data masks a broader picture. The job of family caregiver doesn't discriminate, not based on age, gender, employment status, sexual orientation, race, or cultural background. One quarter of all caregivers are millennials, and almost one in 10 caregivers are over the age of 75. Four in 10 are male, a figure that's closing in on 50% for millennials, and 61% are, are employed. In some ways, as many of us know, caregiving is a wonderful gift. It affords an opportunity to give back and spend time with those who have given us so much, and an opportunity to step back and really put things in perspective. But it can also be difficult and a tremendous financial strain. According to an AARP Public Policy Institute study, on average, family caregivers spend about $7,000 caring for their loved ones in 2016, and that's an average of nearly 20% of their income. And some are paying much more. They pay for home modifications like ramps and grab bars that make it easier for aging parents or a loved one with a disability to stay in his or her home. They help with help a home aids, assisted living, and nursing home care. And they buy everything from medical equipment like wheelchairs to everyday items like food and clothes. They help pay the mortgage, and they help pay insurance premiums. On top of these out-of-pocket costs, many family caregivers experience work-related strains that can affect their family. They adjust their work schedules, often working fewer hours, using unpaid time off for care responsibilities, and taking unpaid time off when needed. Others end up working more hours or taking additional jobs to cover the costs. Many risk their own health and financial security so they can assist their parents, spouses, and other loved ones. They cut back on their own spending, neglect their own health, 
and forgo saving for the future. Now these statistics about the cost of caregiving are pretty eye-popping, and many of you are living all or pieces of them. But AARP's commitment to supporting family caregivers isn't about numbers. It's about helping real people and real families who are facing these challenges in their lives. So let me tell you briefly about a real family caregiver who came to our office in uh, Georgia. Jan Beard lives in Georgia. She and her husband, Bob, have been married for 27 years and they've raised four children. In October of 2015, Bob had a stroke and became paralyzed on his left side. He has since learned to walk, but he still can't use his left arm or hand, and he has suffered some cognitive impairment. Every day, Jan helps Bob bathe, dress, and go to the bathroom because he can't do these things alone anymore. Twice a week on Tuesdays and Thursdays, an aide comes to the house to help out. Jan pays $200 a week for the aide's services, and that's about $10,000 each year. The aid used to come three days a week, but frankly, it was too expensive. Between the paid caregiver and constantly purchasing new equipment for Bob as he progresses with his rehab, Jan and Bob's savings are taking a hit. She describes the out-of-pocket costs as, quote, never ending. Now at AARP, supporting family caregivers like Jan is one of our top priorities. And that's why supporting the Credit for Caring Act, a proposed tax credit for eligible working family caregivers who spend at least $2,000 on a variety of caregiving expenses is a bill we've supported. Now I'm confident nearly all of you know someone like Jan who would be helped by this legislation. Caregiving is one of those rare issues that crosses generational, geographic, and political lines. This isn't a democratic issue. It's not a Republican issue, it's a family issue. And that's why we are so pleased to be here today with the Hill and our bipartisan panel, all of whom are sponsors of the Credit for Caring Act. We hope today's discussion will spur even more conversation across this country. And we are grateful to these leaders who you're going to see in just a moment, who have already engaged their constituents in New York, New Mexico, Wisconsin, and Iowa. We learned most recently in a small town of Harlan, Iowa, this came up uh, in Senator Ernst's uh, discussion in a town hall meeting. So we are grateful for that. We look forward to this discussion. And thank you all very much for being here uh, on what I know is a busy day. Thank you. Thanks so much, Nancy. Um, a few uh, additional housekeeping notes. Um, in addition to those of you here in the studio, we are live streaming on the Hill. Um, and there also will be an opportunity for um, the audience to ask questions, so we look forward to your participation there. Finally, there is a short feedback survey on your chairs, and so we would love it um, on your way out if you could fill that out for us. All right, let's dive right in. Uh, my colleague, the Hill's Editor-in-Chief, Bob Cusack, will be leading this discussion this morning. And joining him are Congresswoman Michelle Lujan Grisham, who is the co-chair of the Assisting Caregivers Today Caucus and a caregiver herself, uh, Congressman Daniel Donovan, who was a caregiver for his mother, Senator Tammy Baldwin, a co-sponsor of the Credit for Caring Act, and Senator Joni Ernst, who recently reintroduced the Credit for Caring Act in the Senate. Both Senators Ernst and Baldwin have to leave at 9 uh, for other congressional business, uh, but our conversation will continue with Representatives Lujan Grisham and Donovan. Bob, the floor is yours. Thank you, Johanna. Uh, I, I wanted to start with those personal anecdotes because in Washington we talk a, a lot about acronyms and, and, and big words that most of America doesn't understand, but, there, but these are this, this legislation is really about people, uh, and I'd like to start uh, with the Senator, Senator Ernst first. What, what, what brought you to this issue personally, uh, to the caregiving issue? Well, because we do have so many aging Iowans, and uh, that is really concerning because we are such a rural state, and we want to make sure that those older Iowans have the opportunity to be cared for quite well. And in the rural areas, we do struggle with resources. And so if you have a loved one that can provide those services in a caring environment at home, that's what we want to do. And we've heard a number of stories already this morning about family members that face significant costs. And we really felt 
that this legislation would enable them to stay uh, active and engaged with their family members, especially when those resources are limited in a state like Iowa. So a number of personal examples have come in. Um, I have a friend who stayed at home uh, part-time to care for her father uh -huh. um, after he lost his wife. And so it really hits home. We need to enable people, and, and we felt this was the right way to do that. Uh, Senator Baldwin, you wrote a piece uh, for us uh, on thehill.com uh, about your personal story. Absolutely. Um, I was blessed to be raised by my maternal grandparents. Mm -hmm. And uh, they were there when I needed them. And uh, my grandmother actually lived to 94 years old. Um, but in her, actually she was pretty darn independent until her late 80s, mm -hmm. but uh, when she turned 90, hip, uh, broke her hip, a uh, number of other uh, things happened, and I needed to step in, first in very subtle ways, uh, helping uh, her pay her bills and uh, keep her checkbook balanced, and then increasingly in, in other ways concerning her health and well-being, and I, I, it was something that I was unprepared for. Um, as a grandchild, I was still in my 30s, and uh, most of my peers hadn't experienced uh, caregiving responsibilities, and it um, made me understand that uh, uh, there weren't a lot of resources. And so uh, the credit for uh, caring legislation to me is so important in recognizing the financial sacrifices that caregivers make. Um, and as a, a companion to that, I've also been very involved in another bipartisan piece of legislation called the Raise Family Caregivers mm -hmm. Act, which intends to create a, a national strategy around um, supporting our uh, caregivers. This mm -hmm. is a huge and, and vital piece of that in my mind, uh, but making sure that people don't experience uh, isolation the way they do right now, often being thrust into uh, a role that um, they're unprepared for. And you're working with uh, Senator Collins on that? On that yes. Legislation? Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, Congressman, what's your story? Um, I'm an only child. Uh, my father had passed away 30 years uh, earlier than when my mother first started showing signs of her dementia. Uh, she had fallen, and I wasn't actually, I was <clears throat> on, a, on a business uh, trip, and I, I came back, and it must have been a blessing my mother's falling, because when I got home, my appendix blew up. And, oh. and so we were both in the hospital at the same time. They used to wheel her over to see me, <laughs> wheel me over to see her. <clears throat> and it was coming to a time when my mother was going to be discharged before me. Um, and, and the social workers at the hospital and the doctors came and said she can't be alone anymore. So we're going to have to discharge her to a nursing home. And I said, could you? just hold on to her for a day or two till I could get out of here and make some arrangements, because my goal was to keep her home. I'm an only child, uh, so it was all on me. She was 84 at the time, and uh, so they did me a favor and, and kept her in the hospital until I was able to make some preparations. Um, I had saved about $60,000 because I was going to buy an apartment, and I spent that $60,000 that year caring for my mother so she could have 24-hour care because my goal was to keep her at home no matter what it cost. It took us that long, took me that long with some help, some wonderful people to get me through the process of finding out what my mother was entitled to. It's confusing, it, it's complicated, and some wonderful people um, helped me find uh, some resources for my mother's care. And I was fortunate for the four years until she passed last March, I was able to keep her home in her own surroundings that became less and less familiar to her as her, her disease progressed. Um, but besides the comfort it gave her, it gave me great comfort. Yeah. Congresswoman, I know you've been working on this issue in Washington, but also in your home state. Uh, what, uh, uh, what was the impetus to to, to look at this and to work uh, across party lines? Uh, interestingly enough, I've been doing long-term care since I was 10. 
and, uh, and I've been doing it as a career my entire life. So I grew up in a house. Um, I'm one of three <coughs> children. Uh, I'm the oldest, but the youngest sibling who we lost when she was 21 uh, had a brain tumor that was diagnosed when she was two, blew through her lifetime insurance caps by the time she was three. My mother was her primary caregiver and fought an entire system before special education, before Medicaid. So the only thing for children, and uh, the brain tumor caused her to have significant developmental uh, disabilities, and she, they severed her optic nerves so she was blind. The only option, which is really the option we're going to be talking about still, still in the 60s, was you put your child in a long-term care facility. You put them in an institution. So this is what the physicians told my mother, this is what the community told my mother, and my mother would have none of it. Uh, so our entire family figured out how to provide educational long-term care supports to my sister until she was 21. Being the oldest, that design meant that I had to learn, which was a beautiful thing, how to do all of that direct care. And then she was my responsibility when I became an adult because my parents were going to age into a situation where they couldn't be her caregiver. So that was always the plan, but my sister died. Um, and then um, I was the move-in caregiver for my father when he got dementia and his diabetes was uncontrollable. And I realized that uh, uh, my mother couldn't take care of him because she was chronically ill. And so I mortgaged my house. I built a, uh, in many states are called echo housing, but in my state it's a casita right behind my property. <laughs> and, uh, and I hope to move both my parents in. But I lost my father while I was providing direct care to him. Uh, before, and so then I moved my mother in with me, and then I have that steady, slow decline issue, including a broken hip, and while I'm in Washington, unfortunately, I can't do it by myself anymore. Mm -hmm. So my mother's not ambulatory, re requires 24-hour care, feeding, bathing, dressing. Uh, uh, she's my financial dependent. I have two daughters that I have to ask for help from, which means they have to take time off from work. Does this sound familiar? Mm -hmm. We have to navigate and organize <coughs> each other's lives. One of my daughters has a grandchild, so figuring out daycare costs and how she leverages her limited leave from her work while I'm here. I also live with somebody here who's a paraplegic and who just broke two femurs and is in a long-term care facility in Virginia. So, and I was the director or the uh, secretary of aging, so I navigated care and still do because I've had the same cell phone number. Uh, since cell phones were invented. So that, uh, that is not a joke, it's a long time. Because it's impossible. And the reason I'm on this bill and so many other bills, um, including my own legislation and helped to create the ACT Caucus, which highlights caregivers. We, have di we get to deal with long-term care. Yeah which makes the current debate in healthcare seem like the easiest debate in the world. Because this is much harder to figure out given the cost and the impact on individuals and families. But raising awareness and trying to get as far ahead as we can so we can do meaningful work is really valuable, I think, and important. And women of color provide by far the majority of care. So I know exactly what it means to mortgage your house and you save $60,000. I know exactly what it means to go through your savings. I know exactly what it means to find out that you really can't deduct the things that you'd like to deduct. I know exactly what it means to try to hire qualified caregivers. I have a bill that would create a Peace Corps-like model program called Care Corps that would engage young people to do additional care <coughs> support for families uh, and create a brand new dynamic in this country. But um, I'm lucky, but I, I know the struggles that families go through because it's tough and there really aren't sufficient resources, e even in Medicaid, quite frankly. There are not sufficient resources to, to make a family or a person who needs long-term care whole. Well, as, as, you, as Nancy mentioned, you're all sponsors of this tax credit legislation, which is bipartisan. As you know, the parties are getting along beautifully. There's no talk of impeachment, and uh, McConnell <laughs> and Schumer are getting beers on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. So what is the path forward in this highly partisan town? Uh, I'll, I'll start with the Republicans, because you control the House and Senate. Absolutely. Uh, Senator Ursa, have you talked to Senator Hatch? Do you see this as part of tax reform? We have started discussions, okay. and I even met with some House members yesterday, and this was one of the topics that came up during our discussion, um, both Democrats and Republicans, and mm -hmm. so great conversation. 
And what we need for people to understand is that even in a very <coughs> contentious, bless you, in a contentious <laughs> environment uh, that we have right now, we still find areas of shared passion. And because there are so many personal stories out there, we become emotionally involved with those stories that we get, whether it's our own stories or whether it's from our constituents. And it's easy to share that type of information out there. Um, so whether we're Democrat or Republican, I don't see that as an issue. You see we've got a wide variety of people on this bill. Um, so it is just about having those discussions and sharing the facts and figures too with the personal stories uh, about how this will impact all of the senators in their home states because this is an issue being faced by every American as they look at caring for their loved ones. Um, I, I look back in Iowa, right now our uh, population 65 and over, it's about 16% of our population. But by 2050, the estimates from the Iowa Department of Aging, we will be close to 20, 21% of our population is going to be 65 and over. We don't have the capacity in Iowa to care for every individual in a nursing home type setting. Mm -hmm. And that's not what many yeah. adults want. They want to stay at home. And so if we can share that with more folks and, and get them involved with the legislation, I do think we can move this forward. Congressman, do you see uh, Chris Collins, who's a surrogate for, for President Trump, we talked about tax credits a lot on the campaign trip. Um, he's a backer of this bill. Do you see this uh, moving as a piece of tax reform, which is, is at least scheduled to move in the fall? And, and if it doesn't, we should do it as a standalone. This is okay. just too mm -hmm. important to, to people. Um, I tell my colleagues who may not be as passionate as, as we all are about this subject, you go tell AARP you're not for this thing and see what happens to you. <laughs> listen, listen, when we were looking for Osama bin Laden, I said, just wait until he turns 50. AARP will find him. <laughs> they find all of us. Um, uh, that's the line of the day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the panel's done now. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, so uh, it, it, it's, seriously, the, the, the goal here for all of us is to become a senior. Because um, mm -hmm. the alternative isn't, isn't so inviting. We, but, we are. <laughs> stop saying that. There he is. <laughs> I don't know how old you are. <laughs> uh, and, and, and I think, uh, as the senator has said, I mean, there's certain things that we have difference of opinions on. Sure. Caring for a loved one uh, isn't one of them. Mm -hmm. and, and so are, when you, I mean, the, the, as you know, Congressman, it's getting co-sponsors. It's mm -hmm. talking to members on the House and Senate floors. Mm -hmm. uh, is that what's going on now? Because as you know, chairman will say, well, get a lot of co-sponsors and, 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 and make it bipartisan if you can. Is that, that's, is that the goal yeah. right that, now? That's, that's the goal with every piece of, uh, of legislation. The more support you could show, mm -hmm. Uh, more likely leadership's going to allow it to go to the floor, mm -hmm. and particularly when you have uh, support on both sides of the aisle. Mm -hmm. Senator Baldwin, I'd like to ask you about the cost benefit, because everyone's talking about cost benefit in this and how it affects legislation would uh, help the economy, but also help caregivers, but that's, that's also a big question. How much does it cost and how do we pay for it? Well, I, I think the cost benefit analysis is a really important um, uh, piece of this because, as was said in the introduction, the cumulative value of care that family caregivers provide without compensation was estimated, I think, to be $470 billion a year. That's more than Medicaid spending. You, so just think about that. Um, think also about the stories you just heard of folks almost at their limit of how much they can do. And the mm -hmm. other option is going to be care in a much more restrictive setting, whether that's a nursing home or uh, like facility. Um, institutionalized care is not what most people want, and it's certainly a higher price tag. This uh, uh, credit for caring um, is a very modest step. Uh, but a very important step to encourage uh, people to carry on with what they really want to do, what's deep in their heart in terms of caring for um, a loved one. I, I, I do want to say a word about the 
politics of this um, because uh, aside from AARP, it's hard to organize family caregivers. Uh, if you fall into that role unexpectedly, mm -hmm. a stroke uh, occurs to a loved one, uh, <laughs> a, a, an injury, a, an illness, um, you didn't think of yourself as a family caregiver the day before, and all of a sudden you're in it 24-7 in some cases. And so uh, organizing among family caregivers to speak out about how vital this is is a challenge, but a challenge we have to rise to. But I think if we heard their collective voices, mm -hmm. this would be law already. <laughs> right. Uh, Congresswoman, just uh, re regarding the, the baby boom generation, uh, I have parents in their 70s are healthy, but but what how and and Senator Ball will mention this is this would just be a modest step. But how important is it to to pass this bill? But is this just the beginning of of what uh, policymakers are going to have to grapple with over the next 10, 15 years? Well, I hope it's just the beginning because, as uh, the senator said, while it's a really important step and a recognition of family caregiving and has shifted the debate from the person who's the recipient of care to the entire family who are providing care. We are, we are caught, and so are policy makers at the state level, in an entitlement debate all of the time. Mm -hmm. right? Medicare, Medicaid, Medicare, Medicaid. And the problem with that is, is that we have stalled out in this country about figuring out where we are in long-term care. Mm -hmm. And as a result, uh, long-term care costs have grown, long-term care cost issues are becoming more complex, uh, and they are creating incredible pressures in our state and incredible pressures in our states and our families. This is an effort to get Congress to start talking about caregiving and long-term care, given the dynamics of the aging of America. Before 9-11, there are two state lab, uh, two national labs of the five national laboratories that work on <coughs> national security issues, right, mm -hmm. in the country. Two of them are in New Mexico. Prior to the 9-11 attack, both of the labs in New Mexico were looking at aging as a national security issue, mm -hmm. all right? Because the entire collapse of economies is related to the aging population. We're living much longer. We, we, we don't have resources to support living that long and families. That money's not in the economy. Those economies have to try to take care of those people. Talk to China right now trying to figure out how they do long-term care. They're look, the countries are looking at long-term care insurance products, much like we have in this country, because they can't figure it out, all right? So they were all looking at long-term care models, long-term care financing, and then we had 9-11, and that shifted, of course, uh, and they've redirected those priorities. But we have not shifted the conversation in this country. So this credit for caring and care for and raise are all initiatives in my mind that create and change the dialogue in Congress so that we have a more meaningful opportunity to move the ball so that we can get to health care policy that's going to include long-term care because quite frankly you're going to have to do it all acute care primary care acute care long-term care in this country if you're going to holistically take care of aging and families, no doubt. Because the other thing that we could talk about all day is that the health of caregivers deteriorates often faster than the health of the person you're providing care to, towards. So we could have a health care discussion about whether or not we're shoring up the health of the caregivers. Um, and I worry about that all the time. So for me, this is exactly a productive and having AARP, and there are some other stakeholders that are really beginning to look at, this is perfect, because now we can talk about it in tax reform, we can talk about it in national caregiving uh, uh, and educational contexts, we can talk about it in training, we can talk about it in a variety of other places that allow us, I hope to finish, productive effort on health care reform and health care protections in this country that would lend itself than to more holistic long-term care policy for the future. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Senator Ernst, I just want to ask you, news of the day, uh, your party is working on Obamacare repeal and replace. Mm -hmm. Do you think that it can get passed this month? Well, I try to remain cautiously optimistic. 
but we have to be very thoughtful about what we're doing. And what I am finding across Iowa, um, just had a town hall on Monday, and in that discussion, there are uh, two, two predominant lines of thought. One is protecting pre-existing conditions, which is very important to all of us, um, those with those pre-existing conditions. The other discussion is Medicaid. And one of the great efforts that, that I have in Iowa is making sure that those Medicaid dollars are going to those that are the most vulnerable in the population. So our elderly, I mean, we know that that is a stopgap for many of those in an aging population, our children and our disabled. And one thing that I value about this piece of legislation is that it's not just helpful for those that are caring for an elderly parent, but there's also flexibility in that bill for those that are caring for maybe a, a disabled child or uh, maybe it is an older parent caring for an intellectually disabled adult child. Um, there are so many applications for this piece of legislation. Uh, but overall, anytime we're doing legislation, whether it's this bill, whether it is the uh, Health Care Act, we have to make sure that we're protecting the most vulnerable in our population. That's what we should be doing as a federal government. Uh, on this tax credit legislation, I just want to go back to, to the Trump White House. They are trying to do some heavy lifts, um, tax reform, health care, transportation later on. Um, on this legislation, have you heard anything from the White House? Uh, because some Republicans are starting to say, well, they really could put some more points on the board um, and get some more headlines if they didn't do all these you know, heavy lifts. Or you do the heavy lifts, but you try to move some smaller bills and get some victories. I think we should be working on all of the above mm -hmm. um, because everything that we do in, in Congress will touch someone's life. So whether it is health care, whether it is the infrastructure bill that we hope to get through later this year, um, all of them are very important. But you look at this piece of legislation, and I would say this is very important as well because it will benefit those Iowans back home that really do need that little extra boost as they're trying to care for um, their parents at home. So everything we do has a reason behind it and everything is very important. Every time a bill is put out there, like I said, you know, many of us, we find these shared passions and we should follow those shared passions. If we feel it's the right thing for our constituents, then we should be working on those, even if it's a small bill or a large bill. We should be putting our heart and soul into these efforts. Uh, Senator Baldwin, um, how much do you, you travel all around your state uh, as well, uh, how much do you hear about this issue in, in town halls? Uh, well, uh, it comes up quite frequently, um, and I will say that I have also traveled the state on this issue specifically in connection with both uh, the credit for caring measure and the raised family Raise caregiver. So mm -hmm. convening individuals um, who are in the caregiving role, hearing their stories. Um, I, I'll share uh, one uh, that's recently got some uh, significant attention in Wisconsin um, because it concerns a former governor of our state, Marty Schreiber, who just wrote a book called My Two Elaines. His wife has Alzheimer's. Mm -hmm. And he conceded right up front in his book that he's fortunate. He had a flexible <laughs> job post uh, governorship that allowed him to care for her increasingly at home. Um, but he didn't find resources easily, didn't seek help, and not only uh, experienced the expenses that uh, we're discussing, but also you know, the emotions of losing uh, uh, his wife uh, as he knew her. and just uh, to underscore the point uh, just made, his health care expenses exceeded hers because he wasn't taking care of himself. Mm -hmm. And he had to sometimes be up through the night uh, because she needed to have somebody uh, to make sure she didn't wander, to make sure she didn't uh, harm herself in any way at all times. And uh, I'm glad that 
he decided to write a book to help others and, and use his own situation uh, to inform and, and provide resources. But this, his story is not unique. His story is not unique. And, um, you know, there's, there's a reason for this shared passion about uh, uh, supporting those family members who, out of a labor of love, are doing what um, is, is benefiting all of society as well as their loved one. Mm -hmm. um, Congressman, uh, do you think that, you know, a lot of people say, you know, you're going to move legislation, you've got to move it in an odd year, that uh, the timing has, has got to be this year uh, because next year is an election year? Yeah, you know, that, that troubles me, Bob, because, you know, people elected us, in, in Michelle and I, our case, for a two-year cycle, for the senators in the six-year cycle. Can um, we trade them? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it must be great, except New York's a big state. I don't want to travel the entire state. Sounds um, so good. But uh, we, we, were, we were sent down here by, in our case, 740,000 people to legislate for two years, not for one. And... You know, we were talking before about the president's ambitious uh, agenda. I think when he came, he realized more work gets done in the first year of a two-year cycle than the second year, just because of what you said. People are mm -hmm. either busy with their reelection, or some, some people get paralyzed and afraid to make a decision or take a stance on an issue that might be a little controversial because it might hurt their election. I mean, those folks need to go home. I mean, it, it, you know, there's, you, you can't be down here and be afraid to, to stand up for what you believe in because of how it's going to affect you in an election. You know, if that ever happened to me, I'd go home and just do something else. Uh -huh. um, but I was one of the 20 Republicans in the House that voted no on the replacement plan. I think our health care system is broken. It needs repair. Um, but I thought the replacement plan put forth wasn't one that helped people that were harmed by the Affordable Care Act without harming people that were helped by it. Uh -huh. And I think that that should be our goal. And one of the things uh, that, that was very disturbing to me was how we were treating seniors in the replacement plan. Right now, the law allows insurance companies to charge a senior three times as much as they charge a young, healthy person. And the replacement plan was going to increase that to five times as much at a time when many seniors are living on limited incomes and probably need health care more than they did in their younger, healthier years. Um, I think we could achieve both. I think we could help people who are harmed by the Affordable Care Act, people who are paying $20,000 to $30,000 in premiums, have a $6,000 deductible, and, and, and don't go to the doctor anymore because it's unaffordable. Uh, at the same time, not harm people who actually now were helped by it and had insurance. Um, <clears throat> and one of the criticisms of the Affordable Care Act that it was that it was passed without one Republican vote. It was very partisan. Um, the replacement plan that, that we passed in the House, even though I voted no, uh, was done without one Democratic vote. If we keep doing this on a partisan basis, every time the resident of 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue changes, we'll have another health care policy for this country. That's unfair to providers. It's unpa unfair to patients. It's un you, you need some sustainability where people can have some confidence that that their health care, whether it be for their dementia or, or, or for, for their spouse, as the, as the governor had to, to, to be concerned with, or, or a parent like Michelle and I had, or, or, or her sister's case. Mm -hmm. You're breaking my heart, girl. Um, you know, at three years old, she reached a lifetime cap. Um, I think we could do both. I, th I think we could, we could, we could get a health care policy that is nonpartisan, not even bipartisan. It's nonpartisan. Healthcare isn't a partisan issue at all, mm -hmm. and, and, and help families. But just if I could just touch on something that someone else brought up, because I think it's really important. I'm the product of an alcoholic father. My father found the rooms of AA when I was eight years old. Now people find recovery for their own benefit, not for anybody else. But I'm a collateral beneficiary of my father's sobriety. But he found help in those rooms because there were people similarly situated to him that helped him get through it. We think about the patient when we're talking about people with dementia, but all of us have been talking about the caregivers. Mm -hmm. And when you're doing this alone, yeah. it's, you're isolated and you think no one else is going through this, 
And as you said about the governor's health deteriorating as he's caring for his wife, um, we have to make sure that resources are there, not just for the patient, <clears throat> but at least support for people who are providing this care for their loved one. Because it emotionally, physically, and financially, it is draining. Yeah. The senators have to leave. Please thank the senators. We'll continue the conversation with our House members. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you. Good to see you. Good to see you. Joni, good to see you. We'll see you soon. Yeah, great work. Good to see you. <coughs> thank you so much. Um, one one follow-up question, Congressman. What, how have your uh, constituents responded to your no vote? Uh, it's very funny because uh, before the vote, I guess they figured he's a Republican, he's the devil. I had protesters in my Staten Island office, my Brooklyn office. They all went away when I voted <laughs> no, but nobody came to thank me. <laughs> Welcome to politics, yeah. <laughs> you guys did. Uh, it's, it's funny because while it was happening, you know, listen, I always give credit to people. You know, so many people in our, our society uh, may have an opinion about something but don't do anything about it. If you're going to stand outside of my office for an hour in the freezing cold with a sign that says Donovan sucks, I got I to gotta give you credit for it anyhow. <laughs> um, we I'm are starting to really like you. <laughs> <laughs> I, want you to, I want you to be careful. But I really want to hit... hit yeah. Uh, Congressman's really done, I think, an effective job. I've only been in Congress uh, five years, but I worked with the state legislature for... Um, more than 20 years. 18 as, a, as an appointed official in state government and then um, as a private citizen I was doing long-term care and, and, uh, and housing work for a disabled adult. Um, I had the luxury, I worked for uh, Democratic governors too and then I was appointed by a Republican governor for eight years. And New Mexico had a democratically led Senate and House. I never, so I could have passed anything mm -hmm. Even in the Johnson administration, I was identified right as, a, as the Democrat in the room all the time. Now, I had the majority policymakers in the legislature. I could do whatever I wanted. I could get as much money as I want. I took a $10 million Department of Aging and I turned it into a $350 million long-term care. We went from the worst in the country in investments for home and community-based care to number one in the country. Uh, we would. Uh, uh, switch off or be tied with uh, with Oregon during my tenure in New Mexico. That's no longer the case, unfortunately, because we took away all those investments. The reason I had those investments, even though we're a poor state, and policies that really made a difference for caregivers and long-term care, is every vote mattered to me. Mm -hmm. I didn't just go after the Democratic policymakers. I didn't <laughs> count votes. I wanted every single member of the legislature to be on board with long-term care and aging issues as a priority. And it is such a difficult thing in Congress that we really don't figure out a pathway to do that productively. And the more members of Congress like us who are really clear that every opportunity is an opportunity, whether it's tax reform or in infrastructure or in the health care debate, to move the needle on long-term care means that we're creating a foundation that you can get it all done so that we can make it meaningful because it's going to take a lifetime of investments for families in order to do this productively because what you're going to have and you already do is great grandparents raising grandchildren and one of those grandchildren have a disability or great grandparents raising grandchildren because the parents are incarcerated with an opioid addiction and they have an adult disabled child in the mix. So we have these very complicated, getting more complicated by the second, long-term care familial environments with 40 million caregivers in this country, largely women of color, who are making less and spending more of what they have, which means their own long-term care, I mean their own long-term financial security, which we are dealing with now in, in policy about what we do about that in this country, is getting worse, what's so declining. Well, we got to figure it out, and, and if we do a better job getting other policymakers to really understand what we need to be doing in long-term care, quite frankly, there's nothing we can't solve in this country. Uh, we've got about 10 minutes left, so we can open it up for questions if you can uh, raise your hand and identify yourself, and then we'll have uh, someone come along with a microphone right there. Uh, good morning. 
my name is Max Trujillo. I want to talk about this important issue that, it, that you have raised regarding long-term care, the different bills that are in the pipeline. Considering the healthcare debate right now, all the cuts are I don't think it's been completely explained fully. If you can use that other mic, because that mic is nice. All right. Better? Yeah. All right. So I've, I've lived in a jurisdiction that I call it the foreshadowing of what would happen if they follow up a path of caps and block grants. In Puerto Rico, Medicaid is capped, and there's a block grant. And long-term care is almost non-existent because of those caps, because they don't have money. So the question is, how do we prevent what's going on in Puerto Rico to happening here in the, in the United States? And by the way, can you take a look at what's going on in Puerto Rico? Because <laughs> it's not working. Thank you. Uh, I mean, one, one of the things that um, we must do is figure out how to pay for and we must do that, in, and I'm not an economist. I went to law school because I didn't, I was terrible at numbers. But the economists tell us that if and we I don't And I went to law school because I was really good at numbers. <laughs> <laughs> so she made money, I didn't. Um, <laughs> the, uh, the, 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 we're told that if we don't do something about Medicaid, Medicare, Social Security, that it will be non-existent in 20 or 30 years. So in addition to our responsibility for those in need now, we also have a responsibility for those people who are going to be in need 20 and 30 years from now. So some adjustments have to be made. Um, but Michelle's story about her sister could tell you that lifetime caps is not the answer. Uh, so, I don't have the answer on how do we sustain this. There's been some um, propositions, proposals about, right now I think if you make $108,000, we stop taking Social Security and Medicare out of your, your paycheck and we could raise that amount to a con congressional salary. So we'd have that much more money in the bank. We could, we could raise the age on some of these things. As Michelle said, when, when they were created, um, the life expectancy of people weren't as long as people are living now. And it's a good thing that people are living longer. Medicine has gotten better. We've gotten better at some of the care that we provide for people who are in need. But we have to figure out how do we sustain this so it outlasts our tenure in Congress and our life. I have a two-year-old daughter. And I say that every time when I tell everybody I'm 60 years old. Uh, um, and, and I don't know when Aunt Yellow Rose is eligible for some of these things. If, if we don't do something, they just won't exist. Yeah, I, I appreciate, Max, it's nice to see you uh, raising the issue that the, the work that we're doing on these bills would be nearly for naught if we eradicated and eroded Medicaid and those safety net protections. I mean, the reality is, and I know that you know this, it's happening already. We're, we're rationing Medicaid in its current context. I can tell you that in my state, uh, where uh, uh, we've got nearly 50% of the population on Medicaid, uh, to your point, not sustainable, to Max's point, if you were to do a per capita uh, cap or a block grant, what, what happens is every rural hospital, every community health center, and all of those nursing homes are closed. And you cannot take someone who needs 24-hour care with significant care issues and send them home. There are no homes to send them to, for one, right? Because they had to give up all of those assets in order to go to those nursing homes in the first place. And those families don't have uh, the resources to do it. And here's what happened. Hospitals who have a, a, a requirement, even though they kept your mom for an extra day, they actually have to. They, their discharge planning requires them to have a safe place to do that. But that whole safe place gets really eroded with the Medicare requirements to get you out of the hospital. And here's what happens. In Medicaid in particular, they will create 
boarding care homes that are not licensed, that sprout up all over, that do not have adequate care, that will take disability or your, your, social, your baseline social security income, and people will be so incredibly unsafe and poorly cared for. And these unlicensed homes are in every community already in the current system, and there will be an explosion. And family caregivers will collapse. All of their resources will collapse. It would be the worst possible thing I can think of. Fixing Medicaid and Medicare and all the other uh, uh, safety net spending programs, there are a ton of ideas. You've identified a couple. It would be wonderful if panels like this could really figure out ways, and maybe it's the tax credit and raise, if we can get beyond the traditional conversations, which are, we'll cut it. All right, what we need to is strategize how we invest it and how we lift up families, how we're dealing with insurance companies, how we're dealing with nursing homes. Figuring out that gives us a whole lot more opportunities for the future than just doing drastic, draconian cuts that harm current individuals and current long-term care investments. That doesn't make any sense. And we know that over the long haul, if we do less institutional care and less acute care, we save so much money over the long haul. America needs to think differently about where we're investing for how long and what those long-term benefits can actually be in this country. And maybe you and I can start that dialogue in the House. We started it right here. <laughs> we have time for one more question. Right there, if you can wait for the mic to get to you. I want to first commend this um, panel and the ones who aren't here yet for the collegiality and the humanity of the discussion that has ensued. It's very rare that we have an opportunity to see elected officials um, talking to each other, talking to members of the opposite party, uh, and being constructive. So my question is, what ideas do you have for promoting more cross-party discussion to solve problems? Well. Question. <laughs> Maybe we should solve the Medicaid problem instead. Um, it's easier. Um, you know. I, I have some ideas. Yeah. I mean, a couple of things that we're, so the story that I, that I gave about the New Mexico State Legislature where they, we were very bipartisan. The state of 1.8 million people. If you're not married to one of those families, you're directly related to another. So we, we, we can work together in New Mexico. And all of a sudden, we've become actually a very hyper partisan state. You know, the sort of the, the media that pushes us to, to extremes and plays out somehow when we go on the floor. It yeah. doesn't really play out in, in this context, but certainly does when we're doing these, uh, what, what appear to be and, and are too often. Uh, party line votes. So a couple of things. You know, when we're elected, uh, the freshman classes get together for 10 minutes? Maybe. 12 and a half, <laughs> all right? And then I was a freshman class president, and we did several bipartisan freshman class meetings, but they were just not sustainable. Uh, they do. They pull us in a ton of directions. That was not a purposeful uh, uh, party line effort by the Democrats or the Republicans. Uh, there is a, a freshman trip that's really valuable that leadership takes you to Israel in that first year that you're elected. Democrats go one week and Republicans go the next. We, there ought to be. So one idea that we should take back is they ought to go together. That there ought to be required for a year meetings with that freshman class to, because those relationships are important. They're invaluable. And I know that we get teased, frankly, I think too much about uh, the days when we were playing golf and making those deals and everybody lives here, thank goodness, because that's not productive. And that's not what we're talking about. But productive, now that I know about this caregiving story, you know, that, that I'm connected to you. Try to get away from me. Won't happen, <laughs> all right? It's done now. I'm getting, I'm getting them on my bill like in an hour, all right? So, those are important, and there's not enough opportunities for us to do this. So thank you, AARP and The Hill, because we, we know we, we can see each other's records. I can, see, I can see that he's on the bills that I'm on. But you don't get these stories. You don't get those opportunities 
we need to create a more mandated orientation environment that shifts the dynamic. I feel like we're twins separated at birth, right? They, they create an environment where we're separate early in the game. And they should do the reverse. Early in the game, they should try to create bipartisanship. We sit separately. We sit on one side, they sit on the other. Right. A great story, the president came to speak to a joint session uh, in February. And we don't have assigned seats in the House. The Senate has desks and they have assigned seats. We could sit anywhere. So when the President's coming, the Pope's coming, when uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu's coming, everybody gets there early because you can't save seats anymore. You used to go at 12 o'clock and put your bottle there as your seat. <laughs> now they make you sit there all until, since 12 o'clock. So one of our, our colleagues, uh, a fellow from Oklahoma, got there late. There was no seats on the Republican side. He sat in the middle with all the Democrats. Every time the president would say something that inspired the Republicans, everybody stood up to clap, and he stood up. This happened like eight times. Uh, Speaker Ryan tells a story as they're leaving the, 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 to go back to the White House. The president said to him, who is that Democrat that like where he's going to say? Uh, it, it, here's a, a great way, and, and, and Bob alluded to it before, and I've been a fan of it. We're trying to pass this historic legislation, repla replace uh, the, the Affordable Care Act. Uh, we're going to do a, a tremendous replacement of our tax code. It has been done in 30 years. If we break these things up into things that people agree on, mm -hmm. And we get Republicans and Democrats to vote, we will find we have more in common that we even know about. Agreed. And then the more difficult or the more controversial or the more partisan issues, as Michelle said, maybe I said, wow, Michelle vote for that, and I know her story. Well, maybe, maybe I should take a look at that. So I, I, I think there is common ground. We just have to find it. And a historic piece of legislation. I'm sure there was something that people didn't like about the Civil Rights Act of 1964. And some people probably voted it because there was something in it they didn't like. But if they broke it apart, you'd find that everybody, you could, you could get 435 votes on something because everyone agrees on it, that we should provide families with the ability to care for a loved one. And then the more difficult things, maybe we wouldn't be so separated uh, in our thoughts about it if we saw that, how many things we actually agreed upon. We've run out of time. Please thank the lawmakers, and I'll invite Johanna up to close the program. Thank you. Good job, Michelle. Thank you. Thank you so much to our panelists, to Bob. Um, this brings us to the end of our event. On behalf of The Hill and AARP, thank you so much for joining us. If you missed any portion of the discussion, um, it will be, the full video will be on thehill.com later today. Um, and also don't forget your feedback forms. Thanks so much, have a wonderful day.